Do you get educational grants to do this from pharma or just? We don't do any commercial support, any type of grant. Okay. Straight out. Yeah. Testing, test, whatever. Give it a second. Yeah. <clears throat> You're right. still good? Yeah. Oh. Just go ahead and introduce yourself and we'll get started. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's really uh, a pleasure to come to your beautiful campus here, beautiful hospital, and talk to you about obesity. Uh, my name is Tim Garvey. I'm an endocrinologist at UAB. I have uh, uh, did my house staff training in internal medicine at Barnes Hospital, Washington U in St. Louis, and did endocrine fellowships in Colorado and San Diego, and been at several other uh, schools of medicine on faculty. I was head of endocrinology division at MUSC in Charleston and have been at UAB for uh, about 15 years. So uh, we'll just get started here. Um, my um, disclosures are here and they're in your handouts. I have some uh, institutionally sponsored uh, clinical trials uh, and sit on some advisory boards uh, for uh, several uh, organizations there. Um, just begin with the case here. There's not going to be any right answers, but um, uh, we'll just talk about it a little bit. This is a 55-year-old Caucasian female with obesity, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. Seeks out your care after she was told her fasting glucose was elevated. So you see, take your medical history. She's on captopril and amlodipine. She's on itorvastatin for her cholesterol and dizipramine for depression. Uh, she complains of shortness, a little shortness of breath, knee pain, and foot pain. Uh, she's single. Uh, alcoholic beverages about consistent with the uh, maintenance dose for human happiness. Um, her positive, positive family history for diabetes. Um, so uh, on exam, you find uh, her BMI is 40.2, blood pressure 144 over 91, fasting glucose 118 with a hemoglobin A1C of 6.3. Her lipids are there, uh, LDL cholesterol is, uh, is high, um, triglycerides are high, HDL low for a female. Weight history, uh, in high school she weighed 105 pounds, she lost her fiance in an auto accident when she was 20. At that point she quit exercising, started overeating, she started showing signs of depression at 30, her weight was 170 pounds. In her early 50s uh, she had failed to achieve weight loss in Weight Watchers due to an inability to change her lifestyle. So which of the following is the most next, the next step that you think is most appropriate? <clears throat> and um, you can raise your hands actually if you can stop eating that uh, pasta. Um, so who would start metformin? Oh, come on, I know a lot of you would start metformin. I, if there's any endocrinologist in here, I, I know where you live, I know you'd start metformin. Uh, who would initiate a very low calorie diet, uh, try to get some weight off uh, in that manner? with meal replacements. I see one hand. Mediterranean diet and increased exercise. Okay. Um, structured lifestyle intervention with reduced calorie meal plan and, and high dose loraglutide. Or consider bariatric surgery. So, you know, I think uh, this is, there's a lot of nuance here. I think um, um, <clears throat> there are better ways to uh, uh, address her. She, on history and physical, you see she has both prediabetes and metabolic syndrome. She meets those criteria. Uh, she does have hypertension. Um, so she is sick. I mean, she's going to develop diabetes at some point. Uh, she is a BMI over 40, so she has a severe obesity. 
Um, and if we intervene now, we can do her a lot of good. We can lower her blood pressure, prevent diabetes, um, <clears throat> and uh, get her feeling better, a little bit more quality of life, a little bit better mobility, less shortness of breath, less knee pain, foot pain. So uh, I think the way to do that, metformin is, not, is, is, a, is a choice that, like I say, a lot of my endocrinologist friends would do. Uh, there's better ways to get weight off a person. Very low calorie diet. This person already tried a structured lifestyle intervention, Weight Watchers, and was not successful at that. So we have to be careful. What, are we gonna do something, just repeat, repeat what's been done before? Are we gonna try something a little different? Um, so I think um, we'll see uh, the advantages of structured lifestyle interventions and, and uh, obesity medications as we go on today. Okay, the first thing I wanna do is stress that obesity is a disease. It's not a lifestyle choice. Uh, a professional organization that I'm aligned with, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, ACE, put this position statement out uh, in uh, 2012, uh, designating obesity as a disease, and I have three excerpts from that. It's a strong contention of ACE that the view ob of obesity as a behavioral decision is debunked by biomedical evidence. It's a primary disease, and the full force of our medical knowledge should be brought to bear on its prevention and treatment. And like any other chronic disease, it's an altered physiological and metabolic state with genetic, environmental, and behavioral determinants, which results in increased morbidity and mortality. A proposition was put forth to the American Medical Association. <clears throat> Their House of Delegates voted on this in 2013 and also uh, designated obesity as a disease. So uh, this is a common disease. I know your, your patients here at St. Vincent's and in Alabama uh, our failure to really treat this as a disease, to diagnose this and treat it in a, in a concerted way has, I think, failed our patients uh, and failed our society. Uh, and I think this is important to, to just kind of, there's a lot of bias out there that oh, this is the patient's fault. You know, the obesity is kind of where diabetes was 30 years ago. I used to hear, uh, well, they just stop eating sugar, get out of my office, stop eating sugar, get, this, get rid of this diabetes and come back when you've done that. Um, we know better, and we should know better about obesity, and we do based on accumulating scientific evidence. Like any chronic disease, we know it's determined by an interaction between genes. Uh, this is a her heritable disease, but it's, the heredity is conferred by large subsets of susceptibility genes, each conferring a very small relative risk of the disease. But in aggregate, they interact with each other, interact with the environment, the built environment, socioeconomic status, with behavior, our uh, preferences for diet and physical activity, cultural factors, and other biological factors, even the in utero environment, uh, to, um, to, to uh, create the disease and to determine who's gonna have a higher body weight than somebody else in any given environment. It also meets the three criteria that the AMA have set up for a disease characteristic signs and symptoms, and we use BMI there, impairment in the normal functioning of some aspect of the body, and I'm gonna give you two examples of that, and results in harm and morbidity, and that should not come as a surprise to you. So first, the signs and symptoms, you know, BMI, we have our normal weight, less than 25 BMI, overweight 25 to 30, and then above 30 and above, we have obesity, class one, class two, class three. Our patient is in class three with a BMI of 40.2. You can also do a waist circumference that gives you another anthropometric measure, as it were, that can give you some additional information about uh, cardiometabolic risk, cardiovascular risk, <clears throat> using these thresholds, particularly if the BMI is less than 35. If they're above 35, almost everybody will meet these thresholds, so it doesn't really provide you with uh, value-added information. In terms of stuff going wrong in the body, <clears throat> you know, um, Here's the spectrum of cardiometabolic disease that begins with insulin resistance. There's a lot of variability even in this room. There's a five-fold variability in insulin sensitivity in this room. Um, and if you're on more insulin resistant side of the spectrum, you may develop later in life uh, clinically identifiable states of high risk, whether it's prediabetes or metabolic syndrome, and then on to uh, <clears throat> end-stage uh, disease from this uh, disease progression, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease are all three and in single individuals. Obesity <clears throat> exacerbates insulin resistance and impels uh, this disease progression. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of metabolic syndrome, you know, we, this is, we know this is a kind of a disparate co co collection of traits, you know, 
lipids and uh, ad intra-abdominal adipose tissue accumulation and higher blood pressure and insulin resistance out in skeletal muscle and glucose intolerance. And we kind of understand a little bit more about what produces these traits uh, in, in, and causes them to kind of co-occur uh, when uh, with increased fat accretion, uh, particularly into the intra-abdominal compartment, you get inflammation, an influx of macrophages. Uh, this alters crosstalk between fat cells and macrophages and it leads to the dysregulated secretion of adipocyte factors released into the bloodstream uh, and they can act on different organs in the body to create the dyslipidemia, the endothelial dysfunction, uh, the increased vascular reactivity, accelerated atherosclerosis, uh, and insulin resistance. Here's just a list of some of those factors. I'm not going to deal with this in any detail, but you can see there's factors that can um, <clears throat> contribute to all of these different aspects uh, of the metabolic syndrome and really uh, even a greater uh, uh, array of uh, me uh, clinical manifestations, uh, not only impaired glucose tolerance and obesity, and particularly visceral fat accumulation, but the dyslipidemia. Uh, we know the high triglycerides and the low HDL, but the LDL cholesterol might not be affected too much, but it's packaged into smaller, denser LDL particles, which are more atherogenic. Uh, hypertension, uh, vascular reactivity, inflammation, microalbuminuria. I put non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and polycystic ovary syndrome under this umbrella. They have insulin resistance in the metabolic syndrome as well. So the way I put this together, you know, some, some lean people have cardiometabolic disease and some obese people are insulin sensitive and, and are not at risk of these uh, manifestations. So obesity is not necessary nor sufficient for cardiometabolic disease. So this is how I put it together. When environment and genetics conspire to alter energy intake and energy expenditure in favor of fat storage, when that fat storage occurs on an insulin resistant background, uh, you get that inflammation in the fat tissue, dysregulated secretion of adipose cytokines, and these clinical manifestations, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, prediabetes, NAFLD, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. If it occurs on an insulin sensitive background, you may not be at risk of the cardiometabolic complications, but patients with obesity are at risk of the biomechanical complications, just carrying around an increased body mass uh, over the years, which include very important complications, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea, disability, GERD, urinary incontinence, uh, et cetera. All right, well, that was something going wrong in fat tissue. Now let me tell you about something else that goes wrong in the body as a function of this being a disease. Uh, and this occurs in the brain in the hypothalamus. You know, we've learned a lot about what regulates energy intake and it begins in peripheral organs uh, that secrete these hormones that kind of register fuel storage, fuel availability, the need for more fuel. Uh, there's ghrelin from stomach, leptin from fat, GLP-1, PYY, CCK from intestines, amylin and insulin from the pancreas. So these hormones are released into the bloodstream and they converge on two cell types in the hypothalamus, in the uh, feeding center. Uh, one are NPY neurons that make this neurotransmitter NPY. Another set of neurons synthesizes pro melanocortin. Uh, when ghrelin, for example, binds that NPY neuron, gets it to secrete NPY, and it interacts with neurons in the higher cortical centers, and that activates the orexigenic <coughs> pathway, makes you eat more. So ghrelin makes you eat more. Most of these other hormones interact with that POMC neuron, get it to release its uh, neurotransmitter, alpha MSH, which binds its receptor on up to higher cortical centers, makes you eat less. That's the anorexigenic pathway. In patients with a disease of obesity, this system is dysregulated uh, and uh, is programmed to uh, produce and uh, generate an increase uh, adipose tissue mass and to sustain that adipose tissue mass. Obesity protects obesity and I'll give you an example of that uh, in a second. This is just the part of the pathophysiology of the disease. And let me illustrate that here. So you've got a patient that's here with an equilibrium body weight of about 250 pounds and you engineer a weight loss intervention. You get 10% weight off of this patient. 
And then you've got some problems. There's a series of maladaptive responses. There again is a function of this being a disease. Hormones like ghrelin that make you eat more go up. Hormones like leptin, PYY, CCK, amylin that make you eat less go down. The amount of energy you're expending just sitting around uh, goes down. That favors a positive energy balance. You're hungrier. Even your psychological choices, preferences for food kind of convert to a more calorie dense foods with high sugar and fat content. So all these things are working against the patient and driving that body weight back up to that high previous equilibrium. This is what patients are fighting against uh, with this disease uh, and why we need to help them uh, in, within the context of treating this a as a disease. In terms of uh, morbidity and mortality, we've already alluded to the cardiometabolic complications here. Um, and the biomechanical complications, uh, <clears throat> particularly sleep apnea, osteoarthritis, uh, and other complications as well, depression, stigmatization, disordered eating, certain forms of cancer, and gallbladder disease. So um, just to summarize what we've learned so far, obesity is a disease in which disordered regulation of caloric intake results in high levels of adiposity. And high levels of adiposity impair health via weight-related complications. So what do we do about it? <clears throat> when we look at our tools uh, that we have to take care of patients, we've had really an increased number of tools available to us in the last five to eight to ten years. Uh, and this has led to kind of a new field of obesity medicine. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so we, we have, it's kind of exciting, we have, and there's more on the horizon uh, of tools we can use to benefit our patients. There's three modalities of treatment here lifestyle interventions, medications, and bariatric surgery. Might need to add a fourth stool, a fourth, fourth uh, 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 leg at some point with endoscopic uh, therapies and balloons you put in the stomach and this sort of thing. But these are our three mo main modalities of, of, of care. I'm gonna be discussing lifestyle a little bit with, and emphasizing medications, not have too much to say of bariatric surgery. But <clears throat> when I say structured lifestyle intervention, what do I mean? This has been developed in randomized clinical trials uh, showing what works and what doesn't. Uh, first of all, uh, there's three components. The first is a healthy meal plan. You know, what the macronutrient composition is is not so important. It can be low fat, it can be low carb. Uh, these, are, these are diets we have ready to go for patients depending on, uh, on how we triage them and what their preference is. Low carb, low fat, DASH, Mediterranean, vegetarian. Uh, but we base this on cultural and personal preferences and then deliver it in a reduced calorie format. Uh, emphasizing portion control, using meal replacements, which have been shown to kind of add structure to the diet, take the guesswork out of it. Uh, some patients, many patients respond to that, uh, and that's data-based. Physical activity, <clears throat> you know, all the guidelines say 150 minutes a week of moderate intensive exercise. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I certainly have patients that can't do that. Uh, they have osteoarthritis, they're uh, you know, high BMI, uh, have problems with mobility. Uh, the data also indicate that anything is better than nothing. And that a combination of aerobic plus resistance exercise is better than any one alone. And finally, there's a package of behavioral interventions that really are there to assist the patient in adhering to the reduced calorie meal plan whether that's just recording food intake and weight, and physical activity, et cetera, whether it's your motivational interviewing, uh, dealing with psychological factors. We find binge eating syndrome is very common uh, and we screen patients for that in depression. We have a part-time clinical psychologist that we bring in uh, to help patients with that. Otherwise, your lifestyle intervention may not be uh, as effective. So <clears throat> there are ways to get that done uh, and, you know, when I think in American medicine, we do have problems there because of the lack of compensation for members of the team that are needed to really uh, execute this a structured lifestyle intervention. You know, just simply telling a patient to lose weight in the office just ain't going to work, okay? Uh, we really need to provide more structure for, for patients. Some patients respond well to internet programs or self-help books. Dietitian, I tell you, uh, dietitians are, are worth their weight in gold. If you can align yourself with a dietitian 
and a dietitian who's been schooled in the art and practice of engineering weight loss. Uh, you're a long way down the road, uh, just an invaluable collaborator and member of the treatment team. You can also take advantage of programs in the community, uh, Weight Watchers, YMCA is active in, in the Birmingham area, um, structured programs in, in the community, uh, but multidisciplinary structured programs, physician driven work the best. Uh, that's when you really do have a team approach uh, with dietitians and educators and physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, uh, pharma, pharmacists uh, can all have a role to play here. Uh, our uh, physical therapists and occupational therapists uh, also can participate in, with patients as well. Now, what do I mean when I say the macronutrient composition isn't important? Here's an here's a experiment that where patients were randomized to four different diets on the left. You can see Atkins, which is low carb, mm -hmm. Zone, uh, which is kind of the right carbs, Weight Watchers, and then Ornish, which is like no fat. Uh, and you can see uh, the weight loss are the dots below that line. Some patients <coughs> gained a little weight on all of these. Uh, but you can see there's no increased weight loss in any one of these groups. They all lost the same amount of weight. Now look on the right where weight change is graphed against adherence score. So the greater the adherence, the more the weight loss, regardless of what the diet was they were put on. So that's what I mean when I say find a diet that's compatible with the patient's cultural and personal preferences uh, if you really want it to work. Despite all of our efforts here, you know, this is what we see very frequently. We can get weight off people initially. Here we see a lifestyle intervention, weight loss of uh, six, seven percent maintained for a year. Then we start seeing the weight creep back up. In this case, independent of the macronutrient composition of the diet. And that's because the patients are fighting against all those pathophysiological mechanisms that I described a little while ago, okay? They're, um, they're working hard, but it's not their fault. You know, this is not a cognitive decision. We don't say, well, I think I'll eat to them a BMI of 35 and I'll stop right there. You know, that's not how it works. Uh, so this is why these patients need uh, our help uh, and medical attention. Okay, well, let's summarize where we are again. So we know it's difficult for patients to maintain weight loss. Obesity protects obesity. Patients are fighting against the pathophysiological mechanisms at the core of obesity as a disease. Patients don't decide how much they're going to weigh, and they need our help. They need evidence-based approaches to medical care, comprehensive, structured, individualized lifestyle programs, healthcare professionals that get it, that don't shame patients, uh, that work with them in an empathetic uh, and motivational manner. And finally, I want to move towards medications because you'll see that they really counteract these pathophysiological mechanisms and really make it easier for patients to adhere to a reduced calorie diet. These medications are an adjunct to a lifestyle intervention. These are the medications we have available. We have some old friends here. Phentermine, approved in 1959. Uh, this is a sympathomimetic amine. It increases norepinephrine release in the central nervous system and blunts appetite. Orlistat is a, uh, acts in the GI lumen. It's a lipase inhibitor. It prevents the digestion and absorption of fats that are uh, dietary fats. And then four medications that have been proved for chronic treatment of obesity uh, since 2012. One is a combination of fentramine and topiramate a gabaminergic drug that we use for epilepsy and um, migraine prophylaxis. But here in low dose, with fentramine also in low dose, we get synergism uh, for weight loss. Lorcaserin is a serotonin receptor agonist, a specific serotonin receptor that's in the hypothalamus. Uh, naltrexone bupropion, another combination drug. You know these drugs, naltrexone, a mu opioid antagonist, bupropion, a dopamine noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor. Again, in, in con combination, we get synergy for weight loss. And then there's loraglutide, three milligrams, the GLP-1 receptor agonist. Not the 1.8 milligrams a day that we use for diabetes. That's maximal for lowering, lowering hemoglobin A1C. The three milligram a dose, three milligram per day dose, gets more weight off and it's approved for uh, an obesity uh, indication. And let me just illustrate this again by going back to that POMC neuron. 
You see all of these drugs, a lot of them interacting with that POMC neuron, increasing release of alpha MSH, and activating the anorexigenic pathway, making it easier for patients to kind of curb their appetite and adhere to the reduced calorie <coughs> meal plan. Some drugs like topiramate, uh, bupropion may act on you know, reward centers or hedonistic eating centers, um, but the point is they all work against the pathophysiological mechanisms causing obesity in the first place. I don't want to go through the clinical trials of all these drugs, but let me just summarize some important aspects here. As I mentioned, they're to be used as an adjunct to a lifestyle intervention program. Uh, the FDA ind indications are BMI 30 or greater, or 27 to 29.9 if there's at least one complication present. All of the professional societies advise use of these medications who have health risk, for patients that have health risk, not for cosmetic reasons. Um, and the addition of a weight loss medication consistently achieves greater weight loss than achieved by the lifestyle intervention alone and helps the patient sustain that weight loss for a longer period of time. Help your patient out. You're working hard, they're working hard. That's what these medications are for. Like any chronic disease, antihypertensives for hypertension, anti-diabetics for diabetes, therapeutic efficacy is lost once the medication is discontinued. So it's a lifelong disease and we, it requires a long-term commitment to treatment and follow-up. And we'll see there's a large individual variation in the degree of weight loss with any intervention, and that's true of any disease and any intervention, but uh, that plays into some of the prescribing information, and we'll talk about that shortly. Okay, I just want to show some uh, efficacy slides that kind of emphasize some of these points. Here's, here's fentramine topiramate combination. All these patients are put on a lifestyle, then randomized to placebo or two doses of drug, and we're looking at weight loss over two years. You can see the lifestyle, they lost about 2% weight. Uh, with the drug, they lost more weight, 10%. Um, so you, you get more bang for your buck. It, it, it leaves greater weight loss, sustained for two years, than the lifestyle produced alone. There's no head-to-head -head, uh, comparators for these drugs in terms of efficacy. The intensity of the lifestyle intervention always varied from trial to trial. The, the only way to really look at this is placebo subtracted weight loss, and I've shown that here for various trials. Ventramine topiramate is the best uh, in, in this perspective, about 9% placebo subtracted weight loss. Um, uh, loraglutide high dose and naltrexone bupropion about 6% and lorcasterin about 4%, Orlistat about 4% placebo subtracted. Now, this illustrates that when you take the medicine away, so here's lorcasterin, this pretty good robust lifestyle intervention here plus placebo in the top yellow uh, icons. The blue icons are people that were randomized to drug and they lost more weight. But at one year these patients on drug were re-randomized to either placebo or staying on the drug. Uh, they stayed on the drug, those are the blue dots. The orange dots are what they were re-randomized to placebo and they, they regained weight back up to the level determined by the intensity of their lifestyle intervention. Uh, so this disease doesn't go away. The weight loss that accompanies uh, medicine-assisted weight loss uh, leads to metabolic benefits. Uh, here you can see uh, waist circumference down, blood pressure down three to four millimeters of mercury, even about what you'd see if you added another antihypertensive. Triglycerides down, HDL up, CRP, the inflammation marker down, adiponectin, the good hormone, insulin sensitizing hormone from fat goes up. Okay, so variability in response. These are called waterfall plots. So if the lines, each line is a patient. If the lines are going up, they actually gain some weight. If the lines went down, they lost weight. Uh, and you can see lifestyle modification on the far left. Then when you add the fentramethopyramate or any other weight loss medication, the curve shifts to the right. More patients are losing weight. And look at the range. It goes from like, you know, 5% to 40% big individual variation. Um, and that's true with, with lifestyle, that's true with any medication. Uh, and that's led to what I call the FDA off-ramp for obesity pharmacotherapy. Here's the rule. Um, if you are down 5% of your body weight at three months, we know that at one year, you're gonna, it's gonna play out very well. You'll probably have 10% weight off of that patient. 
On the other hand, if there's less than 5% weight loss at three months, the long-term prospects at one year aren't so good. Uh, so you can evaluate your patient early on and see how they're doing. Uh, and if they haven't lost if the 5% at three months, you need to do something different. Intensify your lifestyle intervention, change to another medication. Um, some of these have higher doses that you can use, but uh, you need to do something different. So that's the off-ramp, okay? Um, safety, uh, this is a way to kind of look at side effects, common side effects in terms of the odds ratio uh, for pertaining to whether you need to discontinue the medication because of side effects. And they're low, uh, not, not a common event. Uh, the most common is high dose loraglutide, and there we have the GI side effects, as you know, nausea in particular. And now Trexone bupropion is next. You know, you start at a lower dose and build up gradually uh, with this uh, because of the, now naltrexone can produce uh, nausea. So that's the main side effect there again is <coughs> nausea. Phentermine topiramate, you can have side effects from the phentermine, kind of sympathomimetic, you know, dry mouth, um, insomnia. Are the topiramate uh, at low dose, it's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. You can get some tingling in your fingertips, uh, some distorted taste to uh, carbonated beverages. These side effects usually get better uh, with time uh, and uh, are there just during the initial uh, phases of uh, initiating medication. Orcaserin is well tolerated. Uh, we notice some low grade headaches in some patients. Orlistat, uh, if you eat a meal that's 30% or more fat content and you're on Orlistat, do not go to a cocktail party. In terms of warning and contraindications, you know, uh, the ACE guidelines, which we'll talk about, that we just came to the conclusion that th th it's not like diabetes where you have hierarchies of preferred medications. All of these medications have something to bring to the table and can be used to benefit patients. You, th we didn't think the science justified one over any other as an initial starting drug. It's, you have to individualize therapy and knowing what their complication profile is, we'll talk about that, what their, um, uh, what their side effects are, what the contraindications are, important to kind of know some of this pharmacology to uh, individualize treatment optimally. So Orlistat, of course, you don't want to use if there's malabsorption syndrome. Larcasserin is a serotonergic drug. You don't want to combine it with a lot of other serotonergic drugs, SSRIs, because you get serotonin uh, overload. Um, in these trials, patients with depression and on SSRIs were excluded from the trial, so we need more safety data. There's a warning, not a contraindication, but a warning uh, in the prescribing information. Phentermine topiramate, patients with depression and SSRIs were included in those trials, there's no problem. Um, but women on high doses of, higher doses of topiramate for epilepsy, these registries showed increased cleft lip and cleft palate um, in the offspring. <coughs> So uh, you need to have a negative pregnancy. If the woman is of childbearing potential, they need to be on birth control. Uh, you need to have a negative pregnancy test in your office, and they should get home pregnancy tests themselves once a month so they can stop it uh, immediately. All of these medicines, I might add, are contraindicated in pregnancy. Now, Trexone bupropion, you know, the, the weight comes down, but the blood pressure doesn't come down as much as you would expect based on the weight loss. So it's, it's contraindicated in uncontrolled hypertension. Bupropion lowers the seizure threshold, so you don't want it in patients with seizure disorders. You don't want to use it if paper, people are requiring opioids for, for pain because of the naltrexone. Uh, and loraglutide, again, uh, you know this from diabetes, patients with acute pancreatitis, patients with medullary thyroid carcinoma, uh, contraindicated. Now, I've, we've talked about the tools, not so much bariatric surgery, we've talked about lifestyle medication. So how do we use these in a rational manner? And this is where I want to touch briefly on the ACE uh, guidelines for obesity care. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be involved in this process. This is a busy slide. I, I'm just going to have it up there to, and, and just talk to you about some of the principles here. First of all, this is a complication-centric algorithm. So the point here, you're treating obesity as a disease and you wanna improve the health of the patient, right? So when you improve the health of a patient with a chronic disease, you prevent or treat the complications of the disease. 
So it's not so much losing X amount of pounds, it's losing sufficient weight to prevent or treat weight-related complications. That's kind of the principle here, a complication-centric algorithm. And there's two components to the diagnosis. One is BMI. Well, you know, BMI is an anthropometric measure that interrelates height and weight. It's not even a direct measure of adipose tissue mass. It, and it doesn't tell you any information about how that increased body mass is infecting the health of the patient. So the second uh, component of the diagnosis is clinical. And that's really surveilling the patient, examining them, getting a review of systems uh, to screen them for various weight-related complications. And you, you stage those complications as moderate to mild or severe, and you incorporate that in with your BMI component to, uh, to, uh, to, to develop your care plan uh, and to aid in clinical decision making in terms of how you're going to treat the patient and how aggressive you want to be. And in the end, when your, your goal, your endpoint is again preventing or treating those complications. If you haven't done that, then you need to intensify your weight loss therapy or treat those complications uh, in, in, a, in a direct manner. Um, uh, so that's treating obesity as a disease with the objective of increasing and enhancing the health of the patient. So this reiterates, uh, this is from the algorithm from those guidelines, you know you've got the, the BMI and then the clinical, both components of the diagnosis. I've got a list there of, of uh, weight related complications that are key complications. Also complications that can be ameliorated, treated uh, with weight loss therapy. Um, you'll have these access to these slides, I, I don't want to go, I'll, we'll go into a little bit of this in a while. Um, and so, um, again, if, when you combine these clinical and anthropometric components and you find there's no complications, okay, uh, then the patient is here in a secondary prevention mode. You want to prevent further weight gain and prevent the emergence of complications. If they have complications, that tells you something very important. It tells you that that degree of adiposity, whether it's a BMI of 27 or 37, is sufficient to impair the health of the patient. Um, and you want to kind of step up your game a little bit. So, uh, with uh, and you're in a tertiary prevention mode here. Now you need to, you know, prevent further de de deterioration from the disease and treat the complications. So, um, for uncomplicated obesity, maybe a structured lifestyle intervention would be fine. If they have uh, stage one mild to moderate complications, you might think about adding medications. Severe, you might even consider the patient for bariatric surgery. So, just a guide to kind of thinking about how to individualize and intensify your, your intervention. When do you use medications based on clinical judgment? No complications may, may not be necessary. Or if there's mild to moderate complications where you think you can get sufficient weight loss off with a lifestyle intervention, fine. But don't be afraid to use these medicines if there's a failure on lifestyle therapy, if they've had weight regain uh, following a successful lifestyle intervention, and importantly, if they have weight-related complications where you need, you think you need that extra kick to get sufficient weight loss to improve the health of the patient. And, and this is, uh, put this to you. You know, uh, think about what's, what's the dose response? How much weight loss do you need to lose to predictably get benefits with respect to these complications? With diabetes prevention, 10% is maximal. You know, I, I'll show you some data. Um, you can lose more weight, but you're not going to prevent any more diabetes. But with 10% weight loss, you can prevent 80% of the diabetes, okay? We know from the look-ahead study, hypertension, dyslipidemia, hemoglobin A1C, and diabetes, the more weight loss, the better, up and to and including greater than 15% weight loss. So blood pressure goes further down, dyslipidemia gets better, hemoglobin A1C gets down, uh, the more the weight loss. With 5 to 10% weight loss will get fat out of the liver. Uh, but if you want to address fibrosis or inflammation, you need 10% uh, to 40%. Uh, you need more than 10% weight loss. Sleep apnea, you know, there's no medications approved for sleep apnea. Uh, and the Sleep Ahead study, which was a, um, was a, 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 a kind of a tangential study done along with, with the look ahead, they took patients with obesity and diabetes and did polysomnography on all of them, whether they had symptoms or not. 88% had sleep apnea. It's almost like you don't even need to do the test. Um, 
and we know that CPAP, or there's problems with adherence there, but weight loss, 10% weight loss or greater, you can get predictable, substantial improvements in the apnea hypopnea index. Osteoarthritis there, 5 to 10%, et cetera. So uh, you need to kind of know what the complication profile is in your patient to kind of, again, help you decide how um, intensive you want to be. So um, I want now to kind of, uh, in the time we have left, another 10 minutes, kind of apply these ACE guidelines to two clinical scenarios. One is prevention of diabetes, and the other one is in patients with diabetes, okay? Um, you've seen this slide, okay? This is the fentramine topiramate study. Uh, but here's the prevention of, this is the cumulative incidence of diabetes in these patients over the two years of this study. So you see the curve on the top, that's lifestyle modification alone with 2% weight loss. You add the medication, get more weight loss, you've got a, almost an 80% reduction in the progression to diabetes over these two years. If you look at the weight loss category versus the annualized diabetes incident rates, it maxim maximizes out at about 10% weight loss. You can lose 15% weight loss, but you don't prevent any more uh, diabetes. Uh, this high dose loraglutide has also been shown to reduce cumulative incidence of diabetes over three years here on the top uh, compared to placebo in blue. Uh, and that was accompanied by lower glucose and lower insulin values. And so, um, well, so this is a, a real viable way to prevent patients with metabolic syndrome or prediabetes from going on to develop uh, diabetes. Now let me move to type 2 diabetes and just introduce this in this way. What if you had a magic pill? And this pill would reduce hemoglobin A1C by 0.5 to 1.6%, while at the same time eliminating diabetes medications. Led to a 5 to 10% decrease in body weight, reduced blood pressure, lowered triglycerides, raised HDL, improved NAFLD NASH, was renal protective, improved sleep apnea, improved mobility and decreased pain, improved quality of life, and even produced diabetes remissions, that is maintaining normal glucose values off of diabetes medications. That's a pretty good therapeutic profile. And you know what's coming next. That's the therapeutic profile of weight loss in type 2 diabetes, okay? Um, there's a meeting coming up where I'm gonna debate this other doctor about whether we should take a glucocentric approach to diabetes or a weight loss approach to diabetes, uh, which is best. And I'm gonna use this slide <laughs> for that because there's no diabetes medication that's gonna do all of that stuff, okay? But weight loss is. Here's some data, you know, with the high-dose loraglutide in patients with diabetes, the three milligram dose compared to the 1.8 milligram dose versus placebo, we have weight loss in the top left. Decrease in hemoglobin A1C in the bottom left, so more hemoglobin A1C decrease with the high dose. But look what happens on the right. That better hemoglobin A1C is accompanied by less of a need to increase diabetes medicines and a greater need to decrease diabetes medicines as these patients were actively treated to target. So better glycemic control with less need for diabetes medications. Here's a study with fentramethylpyramate. You see weight going down, hemoglobin A1C going down in both groups. 1.2% um, down in the placebo, 1.6% uh, down with the drug. But look on the left, uh, you get better, more achieving, more people achieving hemoglobin A1C, on the right rather, more people achieving hemoglobin A1C targets, but th there was a greater need to decrease medicines and a less need to increase medicines, again, as these patients were actively treated to a uh, uh, hemoglobin A1C target. So if you look at the ACE um, <coughs> diabetes guidelines, they have this slide here for control of diabetes, and there's hierarchies of preferred drugs for diabetes here. Um, at Formin initially, but they really like GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors and the others. Uh, different hierarchies based on the entry hemoglobin A1C level, but there's a little yellow bar going across the top that says lifestyle therapy, including medicine-assisted weight loss. And you've seen the data that would support that. Um, I don't wanna to say too much about bariatric surgery here. Um, 
Do you have a bariatric surgery program at your hospital here? So are you doing more gastric, uh, what are you doing, sleeve or gruen y or what? Sleeve. Yeah, well that's kind of, so uh, this, is a, this has a role to play uh, in patients, um, particularly BMI greater than 40 or 35 and above with, with complications. Uh, more guidelines are coming out now with 30 to 35 if patients have diabetes because of uh, clinical benefits there. Um, there is some weight <coughs> regain following bariatric surgery. And this is, this, so this is what I was talking about, this 10% threshold for preventing diabetes. This is a nested case control study in England. Uh, the patients in blue equal degrees of adiposity but declined bariatric surgery. The patients in red had bariatric surgery, followed them over this period of time, and 80% with surgery had a decrease in, in progression to diabetes. They lost more weight than in those drug studies that I showed you, uh, but they still only prevented 80% of the diabetes. So really a 10% is what we're looking for there. Um, and we know we get remissions, uh, this is kind of a complicated slide, but we get more diabetes remissions if the diabetes duration is shorter um, and they maintain that remission longer. But you know, there was a study done in England with a very low calorie diet, Roy Taylor, uh, patients lost, this was done in the real world primary care clinics where nurses and dietitians who are already in those primary care clinics uh, administered the very low calorie diet. Uh, and this led at, um, at one year, there was a 42% of the patients were in remission. They took patients off all their medicines, put them on this very low calorie diet, then add medicines back as they needed them. And at one year, 42% were maintaining normal glucoses without diabetes medicines. These patients by and large had diabetes duration of only about six years. Um, and he had two year data now that one third of those patients still are in remission. So it's, it's weight loss, I don't, you know, my surgeon friends, they will make the case that there's magical changes in gut hormones and stuff. Um, but I, I think, you know, a lot of it can be explained on, on weight loss alone. So this is the last slide, let me just summarize here. Uh, these ACE guidelines are an evidence-based approach for diagnosis, staging, treatment decision, goals of therapy, and follow-up. It established a diagnostic approach that includes both an assessment of adiposity and impact on health as manifest by obesity complications. Establishes treatment goals that don't simply reflect the amount of weight loss but improvements in patient's health. A patient-centric approach for individualizing therapy uh, to optimize uh, effectiveness, patient safety, benefit risk. And we've seen what weight loss and diabetes will do, reduce hemoglobin A1C while decreasing need for diabetes medicines, improving blood pressure, lipids, quality of life, sleep apnea, and can result in diabetes remission. Thank you very much. Okay, we have, we have 11 minutes for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, you know, what's the set point? What regulates the equilibrium body weight around which these satiety hormones and interaction with feeding centers, you know, generates an equilibrium body weight? And we don't know that. Um, you know, I, I think one, three years is not enough. You know, maybe with long-term treatment and maintaining a lower body weight for a longer period of time, maybe patients will reset. I don't know, you know, again, this is a lifelong disease and, um, you know, I think some of this is set in utero. We're studying that, actually. Uh, in women that have gestational diabetes, there's some imprinting of metabolism in the offspring that persist into adulthood along these lines. Uh, I think in, in women, some women who at menopause or women who have a baby, they sometimes they maintain higher uh, body weights after that. Uh, perhaps that re uh, signifies a change in this adipostat, if, or whatever you want to call it. We know we gain increasing fat mass as we age. Maybe that's a slowly progressive change in this mechanism. You know, I don't know, but um, we, for, for, well, all we know now is we need to maintain therapy, uh, be committed to long-term therapy. Now, not unusual for a patient to say, Dr. Garvey, I've been 
paying for this medicine. I've lost my 10%. I feel good. I'm not losing any more weight. I don't want to keep paying for this thing. Okay. So, you know, you got to deal with that. You know, we, um, we just, sometimes we go to alternate day. Sometimes we uh, say, okay, keep your lifestyle going. Check your body weight. If it gets above a certain level, you got to come back in. We got a little contract going there. Have to resume the medic medical intervention or more intensive lifestyle, this sort of thing. Um, so we, we, these drugs, as I mentioned, two of, only, two, two of them were approved in 2012, two more in 2014. We don't have a long-term experience with them, so we need more data to know how to manage these patients over a lifetime. Other questions? If you lose your 10 percent and then you start gaining it back, and then you lose 10 percent of that as you gain weight, does it still, does the factor still work? Um, that's another really good question. Um, I, I can tell you for diabetes prevention, we know this from the Diabetes Prevention Program, um, the, there was four years of, of weight loss, and then the patients were followed in a non-interventional manner up to 10 years. And at 10 years, there was still less diabetes, even though the weights had kind of come together, there was still less diabetes in the weight loss group from years zero to four, at 10 years. So there are some benefits of weight loss that persist. Uh, some kind of metabolic memory there, perhaps. Um, I'm not sure that's true for all of these complications, but at least for that one, there, there is. But generally speaking, when you, the weight comes back, uh, your complication load comes back, and your risk of complications come back. But there are perhaps some exce uh, exceptions, and we need more data to really study that. Not quite following the math there, but I, I, uh, I, I, di I don't understand the question. All right. Any question from the provinces? In the, in the large weight loss centers, is, is there any psychiatric care? Because it would seem like at some point morbid obesity is an emotional problem or yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I wouldn't. Um, well, of course, anti antipsychotic drugs, um, typical antipsychotics, have a big weight gain problem, and these patients get diabetes. Um, and you know, I, I wouldn't say that the I wouldn't say the obesity is a overtly causes the psychiatric illness or vice versa, but there's certainly an interaction, and they each can complicate each other, and you need to take a that into account in a successful therapeutic plan. So uh, yes, we, uh, so there's emotional eating. Uh, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, the binge eating syndrome, we see a lot of that in depression. Um, and some patients eat, it's depression, you know, to make them feel better. Uh, and so, yeah, you need to take that into account, get that history. And as I said, we, we do have a clinical psychologist part-time we bring into the uh, situation for that. So psychologists, psychiatrists certainly have a role to play here. Yes, ma'am. I take care of a lot of poor patients and who've had a lot of success with this Topamax, a low BID, you know, BID. How many milligrams? See, 50. 50 BID? Uh-huh. Well, um, if everything's going well, why do you want to taper? I, you know, I just don't know what the long-term yeah, effects are, yeah. so I would uh, just find right. that they are healthier right. and better off. Than right. Yeah. Better. Well, I, I feel better with I mean, topiramate. We have a long-term experience with that drug. That's been around for a while. People in a lot higher doses, 400 milligrams a day. And um, 
So I, I think I, I would feel okay about it. I mean, it's a good concern, but I, I kind of feel okay about it. I'd, I'd rather have them the torpyramate than regain the weight. Yeah, that's um, kind of what we discussed. Yeah, right, right, right. Now, now, this is a CME event, and uh, you know, I'm not supposed to talk about off-label use of drugs, but since you ask, I can do that. So that is an off-label use of the pyramid. But you know, um, and, and fentramine is only, that was approved in 1959 when there was only three month trial. So we, we don't have long-term safety experience with that drug. Um, there have been reported kind of individual case series for longer treatment, but um, that's another drug that uh, we use off-label for a, a longer, longer than three months. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a schedule four, but it's, there's, um, it's generic and not expensive. So uh, you can, we even combine, and, and you're right, we have to help our patients out because they're socioeconomically disadvantaged. I mean, we just have to meet that challenge, and I applaud you for, for doing that. Uh, think about maybe in some refractory cases, maybe adding fentramine to that topiramate and see, see how that goes. Um, the, the trouble is you want to take the um, fentramine in the morning to pyramate at bedtime. Do most of the patients who have bariatric surgery gain back most of their weight at the time? Yeah, you know, there's, there's, there's a definition for weight regain. Actually, there's a number of different uh, definitions for weight regain in that context. And probably, uh, you know, 20 to 40% of patients regain substantial weight uh, following bariatric surgery depending on your definition. Maybe even higher, I don't know, but. All right, well, thank you very much for your attention. I do appreciate it. <laughs>